the Greg Fitzsimmons prolific comedy connoisseur. That's what I'm going to call you. I mean, I first heard about you from the, you were on a show, the Fitz Dog Radio Show, I believe, something to do with Howard Stern. Well, I had a show on Howard Stern called The Greg Fitzsimmons Show, and then I have a podcast that I launched uh, around the same time called Fitz Dog Radio. So the Stern Show ended about a year ago, but the podcast is going strong, and then I just added uh, two more. I started another one last year. Uh -huh. Called Childish with the woman Allison Rosen. You know her? She used to be uh, Adam Carolla's sidekick. You know, if I saw her, I would. You know. Carlo, Greg, this is Tim McClaskey. I'm one of the producers on the show. Carlo knows nothing about uh, pop culture or anything comedy related unless we show it to him, and he loved all your shit. That's the only reason we could get you on. <laughs> yeah, so should I just focus on gay porn or what's your Yeah, <laughs> honestly, Kyle, that's the way he rolls. So let me introduce you to Klusky, the guy here talking. He's like the moderator of our show, and he is one of our producers and comedians in Boston. We wanted to talk about a couple of things. We're, um, we, we read your book. The book about the letters. Oh, cool! Could, could you talk to us about the the concept of that and everything? I got the Audible, and the Audible's amazing. Well, the Audible's great, but you should get the actual book because you got to see all the letters. Oh, I went online and stole those, but I, I oh, bought the Audible okay, book. Good. Yeah, yeah, he, pr he printed them out. It's actually, um, it's it's a very Irish thing. I was, uh, I I grew up in a family that kind of celebrated when you did something wrong or you broke the rules. They thought it was funny. Very Boston-ish. I mean, I'm from New York, but I, I almost feel like I should have been from Boston. And that's why I went to college at, at BU. Oh, yeah. And, heard uh, that. and so there was uh, all these letters that had been sent home when I would get in trouble my whole life, including, like, you know, uh, police blotter in the newspaper, my name for vandalism or DUIs. or Like, so my mother saved all these clippings, all these letters from teachers, and I found them all in a shoebox in my aunt's basement in the Bronx, and I thought, I think this is a book. I think each of these letters is like the chapter of a book, kind of showing that from preschool through literally, like, as I was writing the book, I was getting letters from an agent on a gig that I was told not to curse, and I did, and they wanted to check back. So it's like kind of that spirit. It was just, It's such a cool concept, because like everybody's mother has a little shoebox full of stuff, but you have like yeah. a whole life to write about in there, and then like to see right. these things from like it's like high school principals, mayors. Can you would you mind going into the story about the European mayor? Because I I I don't think I even read that correctly. You I, you banged a European mayor. Is this true? <laughs> I didn't bang her. She was. Uh, uh, I'm glad it was a her. Oh. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> so she was. Uh, it was actually very sweet. You would have loved her. She's around your age, and uh, she. She had picked me up hitchhiking in Ireland, and I was uh, I was near Galway, and she picks me up hitchhiking, and then she gives me shit for hitchhiking, and she tells me she's the mayor of Galway, and so she put us up that night in her house, and then she invited us for Thanksgiving was like a couple days later, and uh, I was with a buddy of mine traveling for we went over there for like a year, and she invited us over for dinner at the you know whatever the state house was. And then she wrote this long letter to my mother. And, you know, I was only 18 at the time, so my mother was kind of worried that I was gone for so long. Galway, Galway's pretty big, isn't it? It's a pretty big... Sp yeah. yeah. Probably the third biggest city in Ireland. Yeah. And so she wrote this nice long letter saying that I was a good kid and I had good manners, and that's all my mom cared about. Oh, in the book when it said she put you up, I thought it meant it banged her. And then when she wrote a letter to your mom, it had a completely different context. <laughs> so, you didn't, so you didn't fool around with her at all? Now, if I had, she would have written a letter to my mother. <laughs> she would have written a letter to my father. <laughs> so are you all done with this pandemic? How is this treating you? I mean, are you as crazy as we all are? There's no comedy going on. Yeah, no, there's no comedy. It's, um, you know, it's just weird because uh, I, the way I live as a comedian isn't that different than how everybody in America is living right now. Right. I'm used to being alone all day anyway. It's right. just I'm not flying out to whatever city to perform that weekend so it's not too bad my son's home from college so he's making he's making me he plays uh uh soccer so he makes me do these intense workouts with him which i do every day I haven't had sex with my wife in uh almost a month my wife stays six feet nine inches away from me every night 
<laughs> that gives her four inch clearance. <laughs> <laughs> when you measure your penis, and I know you do, you look, you strike me as the kind of guy who does. Do you go above underneath? Half? Underneath, it's bigger from underneath. underneath. You know that. But how far underneath? Where do you start? It's just the to, asshole? No, no, to where the balls are. You know what I'm saying? You go from underneath because it's definitely bigger that way. I mean, you probably you got the Irish inch. Or are you one of those Irish guys? Who's got a potato pud? No, I got a big dick. Oh, re- <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>! <laughs> good for you. All right. So when you come to Boston next time, you got to come and be on our show or what? I'm on your show right now. I know, but I want <laughs> listen. I want I you in plans for the future. We haven't. We were five minutes into this. That's right. It's like it's like dating a girl for five minutes and saying, "Hey, you want to marry me?" No, I want to get to know you a little bit. <laughs> Don't worry, you're gonna want to get to know me. Trust you me. came up in Boston though. You started at BU, and that's when you started doing comedy, right? Right. What were right. the cl- like? What were some of the clubs that were around back then? That like that we they always talk about the Ding Ho. That was before your time, right? Oh yeah, that's that before, before his time. Me. Now, when I started, uh, first night I did was Stitches Comedy Club open mic night. It was a Sunday night, and it was uh, it was I had a bunch of friends from college come down because Stitches at that time was up on Com Ave, right next to BU. So like all all my college friends came down and they shilled it up and they clapped for me and that was easy. And then I went to Nick's Comedy Stop on a Monday, hmm. and that was a different sport. That was like. You know, you get all these tough guys, like union guys from Southeast sitting out there, shit faced, and they do not, they do not give you the credit for being funnier than they are. You have to earn it. You have to prove to everyone in that room that you're funnier because they all think they're funny. Right, right. And is that a uniquely Boston thing? You would say, or oh yeah, yeah, oh yeah. Yeah, he totally reminds me of a Bostonian. Like, I can't believe he's a New Yorker. Yeah, like, I didn't, I just seems like he seems like a one of us guys. So, know. when you became a comedian, was it because you saw somebody was so horrible and you said, I'm better than this guy? Is that how you started out? No, I always had a great respect for it. I, I started, and, you know, my father was in radio in New York. So, I watched him. It's funny because yesterday I was going through old, old videotapes, and there was a. My dad died young. He was, he was actually. He was 53 when he died, and I just turned 54. So I feel like I made it. Right, right, you know? right. Like the rest is easy now. So, But I had this old videotape of him hosting a uh, – it was a roast for a friend of his. And he did basically stand-up, and he was fucking good. And I was like – I was raised watching him do that. I was raised, you know, listening to George Carlin and Bob Newhart and uh, you know, Betty Bruce. I had – I was a, a record collector. I collected all these comedy albums. And then I used to go to all the clubs in New York City. I'd go to Catch a Rising Star and the Improv. And yeah, ever since I was like, we used to sneak, sneak in when we were like 16 years old. And I saw guys like Seinfeld and Paul Reiser and Richard Belzer and all these guys that were coming up. And uh, no, I, 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 no, I only wanted to be better. I wanted to be as good as them. I felt, I felt humbled to be on a comedy stage at all. That's you came cool. you came up in like an amazing scene too because like that scene doesn't exist right now in Boston. I mean, nothing exists anywhere. But it, it, as recently as three months ago, there weren't twelve comedy places open on a Friday night that you could go do a set at. It must have been like you know Shangri La for comedians then too, just to be able to perform. There, I think there was actually a club called Shangri La. It was like because uh, there was a lot of Chinese places. Every Chinese place that had a back room for banquets. <laughs> They would just show a guy like Dick Darty would just show up and he would go, uh, "Hey, I can make you a lot of money." And he'd just put a mic stand back there. Yeah. He'd write comedy on the door, and the place would fucking sell out on a Tuesday night in Nashua. All of a sudden, you had a comedy <laughs> show. So you had all these agents like Bill Downs and, and Dick Darty and uh, Paul Barkley and uh, Barry Katz, and they there was probably you know six or seven guys making a living just booking rooms around new england and then of course downtown you had um what are you drinking <laughs> <laughs> doctor prescribed I I thought it was hand sanitizer <laughs> <laughs> that he's drinking that too would you jerk yourself off with hand sanitizer in your hands yeah because then i can fuck somebody and i know i'm not going to get corona <laughs> <laughs> The first time. So we had downtown, we had Stitches, Nick's Comedy Stop, Comedy Connection, 
Um, the uh, Dick Darty's Comedy Vault, Duck Soup, Catch a Rising Star in Cambridge, uh, who uh, played against Sam's up in Alston. They're, and these were all six nights a, yep. week, a week. Kowloon's. They had comedy. Did you ever go to Kowloon's? Kowloon's yep. August, yep. and there was a Kowloon's out in Framingham also. It was a hub. We got to get that back, man. I, there's got to be more clubs down here. Open one, Carlo. Well, the comedians back there, everybody wonders why so many good comedians came out of Boston I know. at the time that I came up. Not not including me, but just like the, the guys like, you know, Louis C.K. and Nick DiPaolo and Joe Rogan and Dane Cook and um, Mark Marin and David Cross. Uh, I mean, it just goes on and on. Although, you know, Bobby Kelly, Tony Teresa O'Neill, Bill Burr. Lenny Clark. Lanny Clark. No, but I mean, yeah. my generation uh, specifically. Yeah, 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 these guys yeah. are older, right? I mean, that, all those guys are within four years of each other. Right, right. That's right. crazy. I didn't say women. That's crazy. I didn't name any of the women. Is there, but is there any good <laughs> women? There was, there, was, there was almost no women in the comedy scene when we came up. Do you know uh, Do you know Christine Hurley? Have you ever seen her stuff? She's great. Yeah. I love Christine. She co hosts yeah. on our show every, yeah. every like six weeks. Oh, really? Yeah, she's un oh, yeah. She's unbelievable. She's terrific. Yeah, she's great. The, the first time I remember seeing you, like I, I remember Comedy Central used to be almost like MTV and they would just show like three minutes of a guy's set. And I remember seeing like clips of you on that, I think. And then it was um, Idiot Savant. Do you remember? Do you have a fond yeah. experience with that? Or sometimes it looked like you didn't want to be there. I felt kind of mixed about it because like, you know, it was a game show on MTV and I felt a little bit like... Um, I think I was a little bit cocky right then because I was about 27 and I had a, I had a development deal for a sitcom at Fox and, and I had just done Letterman twice. And I was like, I thought I was going to be the next big thing. And, uh, so when I was hosting a game show, I was like, ah, oh, what am I doing hosting a game show? And now I look back 25 years ago and I go, that was the most fun I ever had. And I wish that that had lasted 10 years. I mean, like, it was so much fun. Because I read the book and I got that sense from the book. But when I was watching the show, I thought you were like almost playing the character of like, like you, you were like taking the piss out of it a little bit, it seemed like. Yeah, I mean, that's sort of my persona on stage also. I mean, I'm very like, uh, sar you know, yeah. like you said, I'm, I'm like a Boston guy. I'm very sarcastic. Is it true you, you taught Ellen how to do that dance during her show? That's right. <laughs> I taught her that. I taught her a lot of things. Which her girlfriend can thank me for. <laughs> um, her, hey, her girlfriend's a piece of fucking ass, by the way. Yeah. You know what yeah. was one of the most impressive stories to Carla was that you met Brooke Shields at 14. How you was that? You met Brooke Shields? <laughs> yeah. Well, again, my, my father was in radio, and he also hosted the Jerry Lewis Telethon out of New York every year for like 20 years. Wow. So, yeah, when I was like 14, and Brooke Shields was like 14, and I was five foot three and she was five foot ten <laughs> he uh he, he invited us down to the telephone we would go down every year we go to the telethon we'd sit there for like eight hours oh my and we'd god meet all celebrities. and i got a picture with my arm around brooke shields and uh that was spank bait for a long time did you met her and then she did blue lagoon right that was during blue lagoon oh. yeah wait she was 14 during blue lagoon she was young yeah she might have been 15 or 16. Jesus she was pretty. I mean, she still does. She still looks pretty good. She looks fantastic. She yeah, looks pretty she good. Does. So, four Emmys for writing and producing the Ellen show. Is that true? This is what Klusky See, Klusky is like, it's kind of creepy how much he likes you. But I know all the stuff. Oh. <laughs> Damn, oh shit. <laughs> Fuck yeah. <laughs> they're, they're collecting dust. There's only, hey, there's only three. I just saw three. My mom's got one in Florida. Oh, that's, that's some baller that's shit not, right so there. so nice of you. That's baller. <laughs> <laughs> so you were supposed to be out here on April 2nd, right? But we were all gonna, we, no. We were going to come to the show. So, uh, yeah, we were all going. Laugh Boston's just one of my favorite clubs, and John Tobin is the the greatest club owner in America. We've had him on. He's We've had him on. Funny shit. I can listen to him tell Don Gavin stories for three he's hours. Been, he's been on our show. He's a great guy. Can you throw a Gavin story at us? Yeah. Yeah, do you have a Gavin story for us? So... Gavin's on stage one night. He's about he's about a dozen white Russians into the evening when he goes on stage, and he uh, he kills. And then he comes off stage, and one of the comedians says to him, "He's standing with a bunch of comedians." And one of the young comics goes, "Hey Don, you uh, you repeated a joke up there." And Gavin goes, 
Record six. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god! These just seeing these. I mean, some of these guys going and seeing them right now. It just makes me want to quit even trying to do stand up. Like, that should make you work harder. It does, but it like a Joe Yannetti. The other, you know, you familiar with Joe Yannetti? Do you know Joe Joe Yannetti? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Just destroying rooms without yeah. even going into material. Like the Boston guys, they set a yeah. higher bar. There's nobody funnier than you know when people ask me about who my influences were and all that. You know, you can talk about the Carlins and the Priors and all that, but I would say I was just as much inspired and learned from Sweeney and Gavin and Kenny Rogerson and Mike Donovan. Mike McDonald, Rich Seisler. There's just a slew of guys out of Boston that that just really had their own voice. They did it their own way. They did it with attitude. They didn't give a fuck about the audience. They, they, the audience didn't dictate to them what they talked about or what was funny. They did it, and you were lucky to be there. Are you still in touch with Howard Stern? You guys still talking and stuff? I emailed with him, but I haven't been on the show yeah. in a while. It's kind of the show has gone from. 15 hours a week to, to, no, what am I saying? It was 25 hours a week, and now it's nine. And so there's a lot more A-list guests, and they don't they don't really bring in guys like me and Colin Quinn and DiPaolo and Attell. We don't, you know, I used to go on, I, I think I was on like 50 times, and now I haven't been on in a couple of years. Greg, one of the, the you still do the Sunday Papers podcast, right? Yeah. Kyle appreciates that. He's a man that likes the newspaper. So you, re- you actually read the Sunday Paper? The only thing I read, I don't read all week. I ignore it because I don't want to drive myself crazy. And then Sunday is like the wrap up. It's like it covers what you missed all week. So I sit down with that and my buddy, Mike Gibbons, who's a big, uh, he was, we went to BU together and he's like my best friend for 30 years. And so uh, he totally irrespective of me, he had his own career as a comedy writer and he worked his way up to producer and he created like a ton of TV shows. He created Tosh.0. Point oh, wow. He created that Showbiz guy's... Show with David Spade, The Burn with Jeff Ross, uh, Carlos Mencia Show, The George Lopez Show, uh, on and on. So like we sit down in my office on Sundays or Saturdays, and we read the paper, and then we uh, we just we do we riff on the different news stories of each section. We go through it section by section. What about the funny pages? That's how we end it. I talk about how much I want to bone Blondie up the ass. She's so hot. <laughs> Her they, 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 I don't know who drew these cartoons. Her tits go up, around, under. There's side boob. She's got these beautiful calves that go shooting out of the bottom of her dress. Perfect face. Hair is done up big fucking golden locks of... I want to get. Oh, That's the I only gu- way to get people to read newspapers. I maybe. guarantee the person who draws that is some the ugliest broad you've ever seen in your life. <laughs> <laughs> like no question about it. Yeah, it's probably Kathy. What about <laughs> what about these memes that go around today? You know the big black guy with the big dick naked that's like kind of hitting. Yeah. What do you think about him? Like, do you like him? <laughs> I'm just curious how you feel about him. Well, I think a lot of men feel intimidated by that. I feel again inspired. Um, how do I get big? How do I get blacker? And I researched that guy, and it turns out he's a uh, a gay porn star. Is he and really? He got, he got yeah. He got discovered at Gold's Gym in San Francisco, and some porn producer says, "Hey, you want to make you know you want to make five hundred bucks on Wednesday fucking some white girl?" And he was like, <laughs> like yeah, and then he but it, then he ended up doing a bunch of gay porn. He was used to doing it for free, and then he's getting five hundred a whack. Yeah, you go a thousand, maybe I'll go God, pay for it. God bless him. It's more impressive the he guy taking jail, that dick. But... So you're full time in California. Yeah. You love it there or what? You, you like it better than the East Coast? No. Um, I miss New York. I miss the sensibility. I feel. I kind of feel more creative there. Right. Uh, I've got all my relatives are there. I mean, I have a lot of good friends out here, but you know, I, I have just as many back in New York. Um. Yes. I like a change of seasons, but you know, look, we raised two kids out here, and it's like right. the greatest place to raise kids. You oh, go yeah. to the beach twelve months of the year, and um, you know we don't get freezing rain, and uh, you know there's a lot, there's a lot of shit. You can send them outside too, like <laughs> yeah, I know. I mean, the, the weather is just like unbelievable out there. 
Thank God you're not in New York right now. It's like bad. What's going on over there, man? Cold? Just with all the deaths, you know, with all the. Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, yeah, I, I guess I guess you'd say it's cold. Yeah, you know, <laughs> unbelievable. <laughs> Greg, can you hit Carlo with uh, an example of what an Irish merit badge is? Yeah, what's this Irish merit badge stuff? Yeah, I think it was always about, um, you know, sneaking up turnstiles in the subway when I was a kid, lying about my age to get into the movies, watching my parents, like, cheat on their taxes as they got older. <laughs> like, it was just always about, like, you earn points by... You know, shoplifting. Like, I got caught shoplifting as a kid. My parents didn't give a shit. They would laugh about it at dinner. Like, an I mean, Italian like, merit badge is giving your I, wife a black eye. Like, the Irish ones seem better. Uh, Did you are, have, you, are you Italian? Yes, sir. Yep. Did what you part have, of Boston? Uh, I was born in East Boston, and uh, we're in the North Shore now, which is Swamp Scott, which is right next to Salem. So you made some money. Um, <laughs> well, my father was a mailman. You know, he wanted to get us out of the city, so did all right. And what do you do for money? I have a construction business back here. Oh, there you go. Yeah, same thing. Kind of cash business. You take care of stuff for people. Yeah, it's crooked nose. You know, we have a lot of cash going on back and forth. Wash, yeah. we wash money. You know? Yeah, and you know people. You I, can get that built because you know people. Yeah, I actually own the building where the comedy connection is. Do you really? Yeah, we'll talk about it off camera. <laughs> <laughs> So how did you end up doing a podcast? What made you do a podcast? We have a show every Monday. It's called the I Love Monday Night Live Show because we actually love Mondays for real. And we want to know how yeah. you feel about Mondays. I think you might like them because you seem kind of a positive guy. It's not We're not about like this like motivational shit. We're just about how everyone else sucks and we're great. That's how we feel about ourselves. <laughs> yeah, I, I feel like that. And um, it's not that I... <laughs> I feel better than other people, but that doesn't mean I feel good about myself. It's sure. just that's how poorly I look at other people. <laughs> but I always love Mondays because um, when when I got the Howard Stern show, I, I was on it for like 10 years, and it was on Monday night. So as a stand-up, I'd go on the road on Thursday night. i come back on Sunday morning. And then on Monday night, I had this regular gig. And as a comic... You never know. You may not be working that week. You may not be working for two weeks. And then all of a sudden, you know, you, you got no life. You got no, nothing regular. So I had this I had this thing I could hang my hat on every Monday night. During the day, I'd work on, like, some stuff to talk about. And then I'd do the show. And it, it just, it was always, like, it was such a great way to start off the It's week. funny to hear you call it a regular gig. That's, like, the that's the seat next to Carson to, like, the entire <laughs> generation, man. You were, the, you were the guy. It's pretty fucking cool. Yeah, pretty good resume you got. That's for damn sure. Well, I got the. I can show you the hairline to show where. where <laughs> That's probably. I we probably took up enough of his time. We really appreciate yep. it. Uh, my pleasure. You guys are great, and and I would love to do it when I'm in town. Of course. I, yeah. I, I already knew that. You know what I'm saying? You thought I was being premature ejaculation, motherfucker. I knew you'd be here. Fuck the Boomtown Rats. I love Mondays. <laughs> yeah. That's solid, man. That's solid. All right, we'll talk to you soon. Thanks again. God Thanks, bless. Greg. Thank you very much. I love Monday. <laughs> <laughs>